Greetings everybody, glad that you joined us again today and uh, we hope that you are blessed as we come to this last section in this particular story of Abram's life where he's called upon to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. It's an amazing story and if you have been with me we come to the end of that story now, not the end of Abram's life but the end of that particular episode. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now, we've looked at Abraham's life and Sarah's life together and we've noticed that some of it was very turbulent and uh, looking at it from a surface point of view, we only get one particular picture of it. There's a lot more that's going on beneath the surface and in Hebrews chapter 11, we have quite a long section about Abraham and Sarah and the faith that they had in spite of what it looked like if you just read the story from a, as I said, from a surface point of view, from a shallow point of view, or if you just skimmed over it, you get a certain picture. But if you stop to think about it and read the full story and then looked at the summary in Hebrews, you would realize there's a lot more going on in their hearts than what we can see. It's like that with everybody, you know. We tend to make judgments, but we can't always see what's going on in people's hearts. Well, now, we looked at the story of God telling Abraham to take his son Isaac, who was a teenager, and to sacrifice him on a mountain in the area of Moriah. And we followed Isaac, we followed Abraham and Isaac, his son, as they went to Moriah. And I noted last week that there must have been a tremendous amount of tumult going on inside of Abraham, in Abram's breast. And I just mentioned that again. Because there are indications of that, as I'll point out to you. But what I want to sh show you today in the story of Abraham is that we're looking at the story of a man of real faith. Because the drama is really intense if you look at it even just from a human point of view. And you read the story with all of its crazy ups and downs. It really is the story of a man who's caught up in a whole set of of, of events not of his own making and and caught up because he obeyed the voice of a God whom he had never known before but in whom he trusted his word he trusted he went to a land he'd never been to before he didn't belong to and there he spread his tent because that was the beginnings of the promised land and so we have this tremendous story in the early chapters of, of um, Genesis, 
and then right through to where we are today in chapter 22. And so we read to you, I read to you from chapter 22, and I read verses 9 through to 19. And this is where Abraham takes his son and puts him onto the altar, with the wood underneath him, and then takes the knife and is about to plunge his knife into his son's heart when he is stopped by God. And uh, you know the story well, I know. But what you've got to remember is that just how intense the drama is. And for all of us, when we go through our own tests and we go through the difficulties we've got to go through, there's very few people who can really empathize with us because we feel things in a way they don't. We sometimes go to people for counsel and advice thinking they will understand. Maybe they can be helpful to us, but even they can't really understand the intensity of the things that we feel when we go through the difficulties we go through. Because in Abraham's case, the son that he was called upon to kill was the covenant son, the son that was promised him after all of these years, the son born to him in his old age, the son who was going to be the one through whom those would come who, who, would, who, would, who would later multiply and be like the stars in the sky. And from them would come one who would bless the whole world. He was the son of the covenant, was Isaac. And so this was an amazingly difficult thing for Abraham to do. And he takes his son, as we read, put him on the altar. And then suddenly there's the voice of the person or the angel or whoever it was called the angel of the Lord. And I say whoever it was, because sometimes it seems that the angel of the Lord is another word for the Lord himself. But we can't be sure of that. And so the angel of the Lord calls from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. Don't do this thing because I've been testing you. It doesn't say these words. I'm putting them in at the moment. I've been testing you. And now I know, now I know that you love me. Now I know that I am first in your life and you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so Abraham had undergone a test, the test of life that God places upon us, maybe very varied, dear friends, and sometimes maybe very serious, and as I said a moment ago, very intense. But when we do what God tells us to do, no matter how hard it is, it is always a proof, it is always a signal that we are putting God first. And so this man of faith, knowing that God had promised to bless the world through Isaac, not knowing how these two commands that stood in contradiction to each other, take your son and kill him and I will bless the world through him, not knowing how that would work out in the future, but trusting only in the God who had called him, trusting in the word that God had said, God had said that he would bless the world through, through Isaac, through Abraham's offspring. Trusting God to do that, not knowing how he would do it, he chose to go ahead with it. And now the angel says to him suddenly, stop, don't do this. And it seems almost like I'm putting my heart on hold. I'm putting my emotions on hold. What is going on here? You've told me to do this. I've given myself up for it. Now suddenly you're telling me to stop. Yes, because your faith has been proved. Your faith in what? Your faith in the word of God that you would bless the world through Isaac. You proved it. And so you don't need to go through with this terrible deed. It was merely a test of whether or not you would withhold the great gift I've given you from me, thereby showing that you loved your son more than you loved me. That you love the things I give you and the people I give you more than you love me. You know that I think that many times we have these personal problems that we have because sometimes we tend to put people before God. We love people before God. We've got to remember that our love is always first to be aimed at Almighty God and His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody else comes second. And Abraham proved that in this case. And so the man of faith proved that obedience to God 
comes first, even if he could not understand what God was doing with him. You know, in the book of, of Hebrews, there is a very interesting chapter which tells us about all the people of faith and how they believed God against all the odds, even though things were against them. And they trusted God. And as a result of that, people were blessed and God was honored and the world was blessed. And one of these people is Abraham. So in the book of Hebrews and in chapter 11 and verse 17, it says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, when he was tested, so here's the writer of Hebrews, thousands of years later, knowing about this event, he's writing this by the, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises, who was that? It was Abraham. He was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. What a thing. It's like the writer of Hebrews is trying to emphasize this for us. Here is Abraham. And, and think of all these things. It is only son. And God has said through him, your offspring, through your offspring, the world will be blessed. And, 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 and your offspring is going to be the kind of hinge upon which history is going to rest. And yeah, Abram's told to kill him. And then the angel intervenes. But what was going on in Abram's heart while all this was happening? And while this thing was unfolding? While Abram walked up the mountain? While Abram built the altar? While Abram put the wood down and then took his teenage son and made him lie down on the wood? And took out his knife? What was going on in his heart? What was going on in his inner feelings? Listen to this. It says... He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead. That's what Abram was thinking. I don't know how this can happen. Only humanly speaking, only if God raises him from the dead could this happen. And then it goes on to say, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So in a figurative kind of way, he did receive him back. This was an enormously important event in Abraham's life. And proves that he was a man of faith in the word of God. And it's only men and women who have got faith in God's word who get into heaven, you know. It's when you believe that God, who says he will save those who put their faith in Jesus, those are the ones who get into heaven. And then you will remember the story of how Abraham sees the ram caught by its horns in a bush. And he takes the ram and as a substitute for his son... He offers the ram up as an offering for God. It was a wild ram maybe or a stray lamb, ram maybe and offers it up instead of Isaac. And so we have the picture of a great substitute in place of Isaac. And Abraham calls that place Yahweh Jireh or Jehovah Jireh as we used to call it years ago. It's the place where God provides. Now years later, Perhaps on this very mountain, the Jewish custom, the sacrifice of lambs for sin would take place because the temple would be built there. And it was near these mountains that finally the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest substitute of all, died for us. Well, Isaac's life was saved, but Jesus' life wasn't saved. No one said stop when it came to Jesus dying. So he dies on the cross. And so this whole story is a great illustration of what the gospel means. It means to hear the word of God. It means to obey the word of God, to believe what God says. It means that there was certainly going to one day be a sacrifice which we could not possibly begin to understand right now. It means that when God says, give up your dearest and your most important thing for me, we should give it up and believe God that he would do something special with our obedience. So here we've got a picture 
of a great illustration, the great illustration of someone who was a great substitute for us and died on the cross. But there's another illustration here, and it's the illustration of faith. And it's faith in what God says. God says to Abraham, take your son, put him on the altar and kill him. And Abraham says, Lord, I don't understand what you're doing, but I know that you've got the power to bring him back to life. And God says to us, put your faith and trust in my son who died on the cross and I will do the incredible with him. I will not only oversee his death to make sure that he takes the price, he pays the price that your sins deserve, but I will raise him from the dead so that you will never have to pay the price again and you will have eternal life and you will live with me forever and salvation will be given to you. Two great illustrations in this one great story. One of great faith in God's word and the other of, of submission and of substitution that we know only too well finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if you come to know that Saviour. Oh dear friends, there's nothing more important in all the world than to know the Saviour that God has provided for us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, I know that for many of you the story is familiar. Some of you may be a little bit unfamiliar with it. Some of you may think this is just folklore or legend or myth. No, it's not. It really happened. Just like what happened to Jesus. Really happened. And just as Abraham was called to believe God's word, even in the face of great adversity for him, so you are called to believe God's word in the face of a world that stands steadfastly against God and says to you, don't do it. The voice of the Holy Spirit says to you, do it. Believe the word of God and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Abraham takes his son, he takes his servants. He said to them, we'll come back to you. He takes his servants and he goes back home and he lives in Moriah. Peace and safety, satisfaction, all of that bound up in the obedience to the word of God. That's where you'll find your peace if you put your faith in Christ. Now God bless you. Join me next week as we continue with our studies in the book of Genesis. Thank you.